So again, my name is Ron Neering. I'm director of international programs at Leadership Institute. Uh, and uh, I have a couple of ideas uh, concerning fundraising, some pillars for having strong fundraising in your organization uh, that we'll uh, talk about today. And then, then of course, we can revisit uh, your questions during, uh, during the, uh, the panel. Uh, my experience with fundraising includes uh, when I became chairman of the Republican Party of San Diego County, uh, in 2001, that committee had was in debt for the previous six years, and it was $26,000 in debt on the day I took over, and I left it in the black, no, no, no debt, no bills, and a low burn rate. When I became chairman of the California Republican Party, it was clear that the Republicans were running the Republican Party the way Democrats run government. So on the day I became chairman of the California Republican Party, it was $4.7 million in debt. Uh, and, uh, and it took us 15 months to get out of that debt. And when I left the party, uh, we had no debt, no bills, and a low burn rate. So one of the important things is that we should, we should conduct our organization's financial matters in the way that we would conduct, that we claim uh, and is, uh, gives fidelity to our claim to be fiscal conservatives. It is astonishing how many center-right organizations do not abide by that. Uh, and uh, before I get started, let me also point out that how, you, how your organization spends money should also be in a matter of consistent with being uh, fiscal conservatives. And that is that you know, we should not have sweetheart deals for our friends. We should not do you know, weird things with board members and so on and so forth. So we really need to practice what we preach in terms of being fiscally responsible uh, organizations. So I want to cover three uh, pillars on which to build your organization's fundraising and start with the, the fact that fundraising has to be a priority for every executive in a taxpayer organization or a nonprofit organization because as our President Warren Blackwell says in rule number 18 of the, uh, the laws of the public policy process, you can't change the world if you can't pay the rent. So we can have the greatest ideas in the world, but as we discussed yesterday, our ideas are not self-executing. We need well-funded organizations and very often we're at a disadvantage because our friends on the left uh, very often are backed by labor unions, which have all this dues money that they can play around with, and millions and millions of dollars uh, in the United States. It's why it was so valuable that we had a recent Supreme Court decision called the Janus decision in the United States, which uh, ends the practice that uh, unions can force people who don't want to be members to pay uh, to pay uh, aid, to pay fees into the into the union. So, first, let's talk about uh, this, which is the donor pyramid. This is something which. Everyone who is involved in nonprofit fundraising should be very, very familiar with this diagram. And if you haven't seen it before, that's okay. We're going to walk through it right now. Uh, the donor pyramid represents, is a visual representation of all the donors and potential donors who are available in a population. Uh, and it tells us a number of different things. Number one is that donors at different levels give for different reasons. And it's important for us to understand what the motivations are behind donor giving so that we can make sure that we are syncing up uh, our actions and our message with what donors are expecting. Uh, we find that direct response donors are small dollar contributors. People are contributing $35 or $50 or $12 a month or so. Per people who generally are giving under $500 a year, um, those direct response donors uh, give um, in response to issues. They're highly ideological. They're very concerned about an issue. They're very concerned about a party. They're very concerned. So number one, their, our appeals to them have to be very issue-driven and focused. And secondly, how do we reach them? Well, we're not going to reach a $35 a year donor by holding dinners. Right? That wouldn't make much sense, right? Because by the time you hold a dinner, you, it's like 100 bucks to buy the dinner. We're making $35. Only Democrats run things this way. So. Um, our direct response donors are people who we tend to reach through mail, telemarketing, and online, right? So small dollar contributors are reaching through mail, telemarketing, and online. They tend to be very issue driven. Social donors are people who can contribute a bit more. And we call them social donors because for these donors, they can make a bigger gift than the direct response donor does, but they want to go to something. Because for them, giving is like expensive dating. They, want, they will write the bigger check, but they will only do that if they get to go to something. They want to, go to, they want to go out somewhere, they want to meet someone, they want to have their picture taken somewhere. For them, it's social. So for them, political giving or nonprofit giving is like expensive dating. They want to go to something. 
I don't like doing fundraising events. I hate doing fundraising events. They're a pain in the ass. They're expensive. You've got to buy all this food. You know, you have a very high, uh, you know, there, there's a risk and no one shows up. You know, what's ha you know is, there's a competing event on that day, whatever. There's a million different things that go wrong. The one compelling reason to do events is if you have donors who will not contribute any other way. And that's why we do events. At the Leadership Institute, it's our 40th anniversary this year. We have trained over 200,000 people. Uh, it's our 40th year. We're not doing a gala dinner this year because it doesn't make sense for us to do that. It would take up a tremendous amount of effort, uh, and we would not raise more money than we would raise through other means. But with other organizations, it's different. So social donors are socially driven, and we tend to reach them through events and sustained giving. Major donors. People who write the biggest checks make the biggest contributions. We call them major donors or access donors. And these are people to exp who expect to have access to the leadership of the organization, the leadership of the party, the leadership of the campaign, of the candidate, uh, et cetera. And these are people who we tend to reach through personal solicitation. And they want to talk to the person at the top. So if you're the president of a taxpayer group, you might have been brought into that because of your concern about taxes, but what you have to spend a, perhaps a plurality of your time doing is talking to donors because you will not be able to reach major donors if you have an underling communicate with them. They expect access to the top. And that's part of the reason why I don't like newsletters. Newsletter, you publish a newsletter that just says generic. When I'm con communicating with major donors, I want to send them a highly personalized update to John Smith from Ron Nearing, update on blah, blah, blah. The more personalized you make that communication, the more it feels like that donor has direct access. My addition to the donor pyramid is this part at the bottom, and that is the culture. And that is, your fundraising is built upon the foundation of a positive volunteer, donor, and activist experience and reputation. You know, this is a highly social world that we live in. If your organization has a bad reputation, uh, if, uh, if people in the organization are unpleasant, uh, you know, et cetera, there's a whole variety of things that can go wrong. So we have to take, pay very close attention to the reputation of the organization that it have a positive culture. Because ultimately, fundraising is 75% relationships and 25% everything else. And I say this as a very strongly ideological and philosophical person. But this is reality. The reality is that people don't contribute to, you know, people give to people and good causes too. Let me say that again. People give to people and good causes too. So the relationship which you have, and by the way, institutions don't have relationships. The Heritage Foundation does not have a relationship with anybody. The Heritage Foundation is a thing. People in the Heritage Foundation have relationships with people. So you have to think about it in those terms. Institutions don't have relationships. Buildings don't have relationships. Donald Rumsfeld, former uh, Secretary of Defense, who was also Chief of Staff in the Ford White House, uh, said that um, uh, never tell him that the White House wants something. The White House is a building. Buildings don't want things. People in buildings want things. So this has to be on an individual level. Don't make people, people are not going to have a relationship with your institution. They're going to have a relationship with you by name. So let's keep that in mind. Organizations don't have relationships. People in organizations have relationships. Principle number two, this is called the donor cultivation cycle. This is also something that everyone involved in fundraising should be intimately familiar with and pay close attention to. What this describes visually is the process by which we identify, bring in, and sustain donors. In the top left is when we identify someone, someone's a potential contributor to us. How do we know that they're a potential contributor? Well, we qualify them. What does that mean? Have they contributed? To, do we know something about them that suggests that they would be supportive of our cause, that they would be supportive of our organization, our campaign, our party, whatever that is? That's the qualifying phase. Then the next phase is where we cultivate a relationship. We build a relationship first. We sit down with someone. By the way, multiple stages of this can be done in the same setting, but we have to sit down and we have to, we have to cultivate that relationship. And here's where it gets easy. Here's where it gets easy. The more we cultivate that relationship, the easier the ask becomes. The stressor why people don't want to raise money, why people hate raising money, is when they're asked to raise money from people for whom they have not first cultivated a relationship. 
So get to know people. This is why uh, you know, Salesforce, Razor's Edge, various other software is so important because you can track every communication that you have with a donor, understand what their needs are, understand what their interests are, understand what volatile topics are with them and so on. So cultivate and build that relationship. And once you do that, the solicitation becomes easy. The solicitation could be as easy as, you know, we have our, we have our big dinner coming up in three months. Why don't you put a table together for that? A solicitation could be as easy as that. If You've developed a relationship first. Then we go on to acknowledgement after someone has made the gift, and, th and then things usually fall apart. Because where things tend to fall apart is in this next phase of stewardship. Stewardship means maintaining the relationship when you're not asking for money. So we have a rule of thumb at the Leadership Institute that for every time we ask someone for money, they hear from us three times not asking for money. Because we don't want to train our donors that if they receive something from us, it's always an ask. And there are other people in the fundraising community who have a difference of opinion. They say, oh, it doesn't cost anything to drop a donor envelope you know, into something and so on and so forth. And that may be true, but our philosophy is we want to build that relationship over time. And that's why we have a very good track record of holding on to donors over time because of this stewardship. If your organization drops the ball on fundraising, chances are it's in this stewardship phase. So. Let's keep that in mind. Three things that are needed uh, in order to be successful as a fundraiser. One is to have great plans and ideas, and this is where we tend to overemphasize. And the next area is in our, our narrative, where we tend to underemphasize. What's our narrative? What's our story? What is this, and what's your story as a fundraiser? What is your, your personal story? How is it that you came from wherever you came from and to wind up working for this organization? And does that story inspire other people to, to give? Next, powerfully define who you are and what you do. It is amazing how many organization names I can type into YouTube and not get a result that you would want me to get. So we're going to talk about this tomorrow. In, uh, in, in our social media session, we're going to talk about YouTube as a search engine, which it is. It's the number two search engine in the world. It's one of the top three. Google is number one. YouTube is number two. Facebook is number three. So we have to powerfully define what we do. How many people in this room have ever heard of an organization called Jewish National Fund? OK, one, two, three. Good, because I picked this group because I wanted to pick an organization that you have not heard of. So I want to show you a video uh, by Jewish National Fund, and I want you to tell me, since only three people in the room heard of the organization, at the end of this video, which is three minutes and 43 seconds long, tell me if you have an idea as to what this organization does. And now we have no audio. OK. Okay, I'll skip the video. So no video, sorry, um, technical problems. Point number three is to tell more stories. Uh, and this is an area where those of us on the right tend to fail down, uh, fall down a great deal, where those of us on the left tend to do a better job. Those of us on the left, yeah, like there's anyone on the left in this room. Um, <laughs> I don't have any audio, but I wanted to show this video anyway because it's, it should be able to work. The audio really makes it better, uh, but you can get the video without it in terms of the importance of telling a story. Just watch this. That's a Google Super Bowl. One of the best things I have in the Super Bowl in America is we get to see a lot of these great ads because so many people watch it. Uh, but this is a story, right? This, this was an ad for a search engine, but it told a story. And so we need to ensure that we're telling stories when we sit down with donors. That it's not just about statistics and bar charts and so on and so forth. Um, and um, finally, let me recommend 
uh, this book. I mentioned it yesterday. I'm going to mention it again today. If you are in the relationship business and if you are in the fundraising business, you are in the relationship business, then you must read this book. Uh, and uh, The Like Switch by Jack Schaefer, former FBI behavioral psychologist. And it's about all the nonverbal signals that we send to people that turn people off. Uh, and, and the nonverbal signals we send to people that can draw people to us and help us to be more effective. Because if we're sitting down raising money with people, we need people to like us. We need people to respond you know, positively. So, I, so my, uh, my family is German, so we don't do humor. So this book was very you know, helpful for me um, uh, going forward as a, as a fundraiser. And I, I highly recommend it. I think you'll find it uh, to be very useful. Um, last point is I want to invite you to our International School of Fundraising. Uh, every year we put on this program. Uh, it's our premier international program because we believe so passionately in the importance of being able to raise money. It will be in Rome. It's the 23rd through the 26th. Uh, of July, and I have a flyer that I'm going to hand out to everyone, and I think I just did this in the time allotted. So thank you very much. I look forward to the panel. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I'll keep this short so we can keep the program moving along. I'm Al Kanata. I'm Director of Development with the Atlas Network. Thank you, Vale. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, I've been doing nonprofit fundraising for the last 15 years, and as Terry said in the intro while we were competing with the opening with the other panel, uh, I had the misery of working for her for almost four years. Um, and I guess she was my boss then, she's still my boss now, so things just never change. Um, Ron's presentation was perfect for me because I want to talk about some examples from the field that I think cover a lot of what Ron does and I think what make for good fundraising practices. So let me just get into it. But first, in a moment, I want to ask everybody, in a moment, I want to ask everyone to close their eyes and then keep them closed until I ask you to reopen them. So everyone in the room, close your eyes. Open them. Does anyone know how long that was? Five seconds, right? I want you to hold that number in your head, five seconds, because when you're a fundraiser and you're in front of a donor, five seconds may or may or make or break that ask in front of them. But let's we'll revisit that in just a minute. Um, so fundraising, what is it? Why do we call it development most of the time, right? In my mind, it's not some sort of sly way of getting in the door with somebody who might otherwise be uncomfortable. Ultimately, we're building relationships, right? That's what fundraising is, that's what development is. It's building a relationship with the donor, it's building a relationship with other people in the organization so you can best service donors. Ultimately, that's what we're doing. We are building relationships constantly over and over again. And that's fundraising, right? We're not burning through people. We're not treating them like garbage. It's about relationships. This is what my brother thinks I do every day. And again, it's not. Let me tell you an example of why it's not. Um, I want everyone to picture it. Nine years ago, I was sitting in a cafeteria in Richmond, Virginia, in a donor meeting. It's one of the first times I ever made a face-to-face -face ask, asking somebody for a six-figure gift. So why am I here? Why am I making this ask? And how did it go? I'm with my uh, good friend, the great Vinny Vernuccio. Uh, we were touring around seeing some donors, and we stopped by to see our friend Stan. Um, Stan was somebody who was deeply interested in work that the Competitive Enterprise Institute was doing, and we had a great conversation. Stan and I were getting caught up on a few things. He had heard Vinny, coincidentally enough, on the, Vin on the radio the day before, and it was great for him to actually have a chance to meet some of the program people at C CEI to better understand what we do. As the conversation progressed, I told him what some of our plans were in a policy area he really cared about. And at that moment, I said, so Stan, you know I'm here, and would you give CEI $200,000 to help us with this? And then, the five seconds. Silence. Why did I stop talking? Because I wanted an answer, right? And the other reason, and for other reasons I stopped. One, it's rude, 
right? If you ask somebody and then you still start talking, it's one of the rudest things you can do, regardless if it's a donor meeting or not. But the other reason is you tend to talk yourself down, right? Sometimes it's a nervous moment, right? It's like, oh, how, would you give $200,000 or maybe one seventy-five, one hundred fifty, and by the time you know it, you're, you're already setting yourself back. Um, so why this donor, why this time, and why now? Or why was it the, the right ask? It's for the same reason that I asked someone for a half million dollar gift six months ago, for the same reason that I used to, that I routinely ask people for dinner sponsorships, because I've built a relationship with that donor that says, okay, he's interested in this part or of the organization or the organization's vision. He's shown a financial interest. He's shown interest in a particular program. The timing is good, let's do it, right? It's all about that relationship over and over again. Right? It's preparing yourself to make that ask. And preparation is key. Um, if you're not preparing yourself before a meeting, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, people know when you're not prepared. And preparing is not five minutes before a meeting and scribbling three or four bullet points. Right? Just a couple of stats and figures. If you make $500 an hour, how much is that on an annual basis in terms of salary? I mean, it's a million dollars a year. Right? Somebody who's earning $5,000 an hour is $10 million a year in income. Someone who's earning $50,000 a year is $100 million a year in annual income. Right? If many of the people you're going to be in touch with earn that kind of money, you owe it to yourself and the donor to spend an hour, a couple hours, or whatever the amount of appropriate time is to prepare. Right? Um, if someone's giving you a lot, remember something. It's not just simply an ask. It's not a one-off thing. It's a partnership, right? It's this. This is what we do on a daily day, day to day basis. And as Ron talks about, after the gift's gotten, many organizations fall down in the stewardship category. Um, most of the time, we like to talk about positive stories, but I want to talk about something that's a little harder, right? In all relationships, whether it's marriage, whether it's a friendship, whether it's somebody you just met at the bar, right? Sometimes it's always, it can be very positive and sometimes you have to have a coming to Jesus moment. Um, one of those came, well, I've had a few of those, but one of those came at CEI where we had a program we really liked and a donor that, sorry, and who liked this particular program. But we realized something, it was the wrong program for us, right? Responsible use of donor funds is knowing when you're doing something that no longer makes sense for the organization. <clears throat> and we had a chat with the donor saying, we don't think this is for us for any, anymore. Anyone take a guess how that conversation went with the donor? Some, there's gotta be someone out there. I'm actually asking, I'm not asking the question rhetorically, I'm actually asking. I don't know, that's a great question actually. I don't, I don't think so. But I didn't have an idea how that conversation went after we had it with the donor. No. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it long. Um, it was a relief for both parties. The donor realized that, the donor never felt like his money had been wasted, but I think he realized it was no longer productive use of funds, and we realized it was no longer productive use of management time or funds. So what happened? The donor's contribution went down by 75%. But it was actually a net positive. We no longer were trying to kind of make a program work that didn't make sense for us. And we weren't spending a lot of time managing it. And all of a sudden the donor was, he actually more bought into the general vision. And that donor's contribution began to recover and go up again over time, right? That honesty in relationships is the only thing we have to survive on, right? We're not like American Airlines, oh, I'll give you 10,000 miles or an extra legroom seat, right? We don't have that as an option for us, right? So our independence and integrity is everything. Which reminds me of another story that I think is critical that many organizations forget about. Um, the process stuff really matters. Uh, 12 years ago when Terry and I were at CEI, we launched CEI's direct mail program. And we spent months finding the right message, the right list, the right letter, and the like. And we launch. And in the first week of the program, 
we got as many gifts in one week as we used to get in one year. Great success. I'm, I'm ecstatic. I'm running around the office. I have like two sacks of checks here and I feel like a father with newborn twins. And our boss, Fred Smith, looks at me and says, hey, Al, that's great, but one of these donors is going to get thanked. Everything changed, right? First is calling my wife saying, hey, I'm, I'm not coming home tonight. We had a really good day at the office, so I need another six hours here to get some work done. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Oh, wait, I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, every process we thought we had broke, right? So that process and how we, process, how we handle gifts, make sure a donor gets thanked in a timely fashion, everything had to, got, had to get rethought to make sure that we were properly servicing the donor, right? When they get that thank you note matters, right? When they get a communication about a program matters. All those customer service elements matter, right? So your organization needs to think about that. Who's doing that? It's not always going to be the person who's in front of the donor, right? Back in those days, Terry was in front of the donors all the time. I was the one making sure the check people got thanked. Um, that, those roles and speciali specializations absolutely matter. Um, which brings me to my final point. We're at the Friedman Conference, so I need a picture of Milton Friedman on stage. No one person knows how to make a pencil, right? And no one person ultimately knows how to make a good donor relationship. Making a donor relationship is a combination of lots of things. How an organization conducts itself, how you, the major gifts officer conducts itself in front of a donor, and how that backend support in an organization ensures that someone has the right information, that someone's being thanked properly, that someone's being kept up to date, all that matters. So thank you. <laughs>